And then I, hey, you guys. <laughs> this is the, the you flick. This you is the lid. How you doing? How you doing? This is How the you... Lynn and Debbie show. I'm Lynn Serrano and you are? I'm Debbie Bettendorf. Oh my goodness. And we're going to have oh gosh. somebody from the real and raw slash Brian Kell. <laughs> Who? Oh my gosh. I didn't so, know. Yeah. So we'll be right back after we'll be this. right back. Welcome back, you guys. I'm kind of laughing here, Debbie. Do you see what I see? Yes, I do. <laughs> do you see that somebody somebody's hiding in the back, but he doesn't understand he's not up here yet? <laughs> oh, I love it. This well, is just... you know, when you're used to being a co-host and not the guest, <laughs> there's a little learning curve there. Yeah, there is. So uh, today is super, super excited. And um, I'm excited because I, get, I don't think people realize that last week we interviewed Cheryl and now you're going to get to interview Brian and soon you'll get to interview Scott. Yes. And it's like, what do all these people have in common? I know. I know, right? Maybe well, they'll figure they it out. In common? Are you going to tell them? Maybe, maybe they'll figure it out. But yes. Anyways, I know you're super excited because you just getting to know Brian. Yeah. And um, this is, you're like getting to know. I can't wait to ask a bunch of questions. Absolutely. So um, without further ado, I know he's just like peeking out, trying to peek out here. So <laughs> I, enough of Great. whatever. We're just going to get on oh, with the show today. Goal. It's going to be a quick 30, 40 minutes show yeah. and it's going to be exciting. So hold on. We're going to be right back after this handsome guy here, Mr. Brian Kelm. Hold on. And there he is, <laughs> the one and only Brian, Brian Kell. Welcome to the Lynn and Debbie show. It's, a, <laughs> it's an honor and privilege to be here. It's so nice to finally meet you almost in person, face I, to face, right? Oh, he, he stuck on the co-host. You're not the co-host today. No, <laughs> that's, that's okay. I need a break. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know if this is going to be a break. I have a tendency to drill. Grrr, question. No, I, I I did a little reconnaissance, and I I know that about you, Debbie. So I'm ready. <laughs> okay, you did your due diligence. You are aware. Okay, okay. that's good news. I got my <laughs> bottle of water and coffee ready. Oh, good. I guess. <laughs> Maybe a little towel to wipe your brow. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's what my hand is for. So we'll run okay. with that. Okay, we got it's, it. It's a good thing that he knows how to improv. Oh, yeah. Well, we I think all three of us know how to do a little bit of that. I'm glad. What, what the audience doesn't see is what I was doing backstage with the camera shutter. So <laughs> kind of... You're funny. Oh, my gosh. You, you are super funny. Brian, welcome to uh, to the show here. We are super excited. This is part of a little series that we're going to have going on later. So it's mm -hmm. to get to know the co-host. Now I got two co-hosts on here. I'm yeah. honored to call them my co-host. And they are awesome people. And uh, you guys are in for a ride. So um, I'm going to put one question here. I'm going to let Debbie just had at it. Had yeah. At it. Have at I'm it. it. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Hello, Brian. Hello. Welcome to the show. Oh. Hey, you know, we all just want to start by getting to know a little bit about your background. And so what better place to start than to figure out where in the heck were you born and raised? Sure. So I was born in the Midwest. Uh, the actual uh, particular city in Wisconsin was Beaverdam, Wisconsin. It's a town of about, now it's probably 20,000 people uh, between Madison and Fond du Lac. Um, and then if you go a little further north, then you run into those Green Bay Packers. Ooh. Um, and uh, since a very young age, um, I was raised to never forget where you came from. Mm. And so... No matter, I mean, everybody gave me an opportunity as I was going through my career of entrepreneurship and finding my passion. 
And so anytime I go there, it's still the same, <laughs> um, just a little bit more modern. But that is something that's been instilled within me is that just the humble times, humble means work hard, blue collar and uh, never forget where you came from, no matter where it takes you. Right. I, I agree with that. Always remember where you came from in the way of, uh, you know, just sticking close to your roots and the integrity of it. But mm -hmm. now, where are you now? Sure. I'm in uh, right outside of Milwaukee right now. Okay. Um, I balance between um, Milwaukee or the suburbs of Milwaukee and then Watertown, Wisconsin. Um, my uh, my dad passed away uh, coming up this year will be, let's see here, 2000, 2010. So it'll be 12 years uh, here in a couple of days. And um, so I'm an only child. So I want to make sure I take good care of my mom and I'm always there to help her. So I balance my time between that and then over by my girlfriend over in Milwaukee. So, okay. Okay. Uh, He's a busy boy. I know. <laughs> and good for you to want to take care of your mother. That's, yeah. that's huge. That's amazing. I just, that makes me feel like so much love for you to do that because that does, you know, Len and I were talking the other day about aging and how once a child, quiet, no, once a man, twice a child, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we rely on the ones that we raise at some point to then take care of us, maybe. Mm -hmm. But anyway, <laughs> let's talk about Lynn. What other questions can we ask him right off the jump before I get into what I really want to attack you about? I know, I know. I did. Okay, so what did you study <laughs> college. I, I know you went to college and I already know this, but I yeah. want the crowd to know. Well, for the first, uh, let's see, a couple semesters, it was alcohol. Oh, um, you know, Study of be, alcohol. yeah, alcohol and uh, women and uh, <laughs> no, not Brian. No. Well, I love the honesty here. Yeah. You know, let's just say it like it is. You gotta, well, and, there, and there's two I things I there's alcohol. two things I live my life by every day is transparency and uh, vulnerability. And so and if somebody can't accept that I'm telling them the truth or whatever, if it's too, um, too much, well, I'd rather let it all out and that's yeah. it, you know? So, um, but after I got my, uh, after I got that out of my system and fully lived out college, which, uh, you know, was great and I'm glad I did it. Did I have to return and take some more classes over? Of course I did. Um, but it's not matter where you start, it's a matter where you end. So I ended up, uh, the first time I was at the university of Wisconsin, Whitewater, I graduated with a triple major in advertising, marketing, and psychology, and uh, completely moved out of my frat house, um, lived with a couple other guys, put education in front of everything else. And because uh, my, you know, I just, I got caught up in the lifestyle and it didn't last long, but, you know, I, I determined what I was there for and I, I got it done. And now I live my life by education. Every class I can possibly take, I'm, you know, I, I spend a good amount of revenue every year investing in myself. And it seems like it's more now than less because of all the digital courses and all the master classes. Inflation, inflation. No. Yeah. Inflation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Brian, we're certainly glad that you got your first bachelor's degree in alcohol and women. Right. <laughs> and then you decided to go on back and give it another try. And actually, I. I don't personally know of anyone who tr who triple majored um, at one time at one time. So that is extremely amazing to me. So, mm -hmm. wow. Good for you. <laughs> and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this later. But your psychology background, I'm certain, helps you with your current career. It's and um, yeah, so that's that's fun. That's good. Good for you that you have mm -hmm. all of those and that you continue your education. That's amazing. Well, and it's, uh, you know, I love education so much that uh, a couple of years after I graduated, um, I wanted to give my customers the, the gift of more education through the performing arts background. And so I went to my alma mater and I called them up and I said, hey, I want to come back to school. And I'm like, what do I need to do? And they're like, you got money. And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, you're in. <laughs> so. Um, is that the, how that works? The bar wasn't really too high. Apparently they, you know. That's funny. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Well, uh, I did it from a performing arts standpoint is because of, you know, um, that's what was really needed. I wanted to hone my skills for stage. I wanted to hone my skills for camera. And it, because we're always improvising, as, as Lynn mentioned earlier, we're always improvising. We're improvising right now. And that was one of my disciplines is that I really wanted to hone and I want to do it for my customers. Mm -hmm. But also, though, knowing that I'm taking on these skill sets and this training, I don't know what I'm going to turn into or transform into. So that's the most beautiful part. 
you know. Um, so I graduated with a partial degree in the performing arts. And then in 2020, I earned my master's in winning and event planning. So wow. lots of education and ongoing classes. Wow. In 2020, was it virtual for you too? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And like you said earlier, a lot of digital, I mean, there are more opportunities now that you can do things digitally, but you know, sometimes you want that in class experience as well, but you've done that a lot already. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I got to say, and to whomever is watching currently or will watch this show, this show, I have watched you and Lynn together on you, on you, on your own show and I got to tell you, you guys can go so deep and analyze things while still making it fun. So that's really cool. And I enjoy even like the little um, nuggets of information that you've provided already, Brian, because okay. it's like if, if you really guys, that's everyone that's listening, really pay attention to what he says, because he's not saying things just to take up space. He's really it thoughtful in in his uh, delivery of the, his words. So, OK, we'll continue. OK, so. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about whether this was in your past growing up currently any time in your life who has made a positive impact on you yeah i would uh number one my dad um it, it's crazy because i didn't really see i didn't really realize who he, who he was when he was alive right mm -hmm. that hopefully that doesn't sound morbid or whatever but i had a near-death experience and then before he passed away and then nine months after that near-death experience he, he <laughs> passed away I am watching you, Jerry. Oh, I'm Jerry. watching you too. <laughs> I'm sorry. You were I in a tender moment there. Like Jerry is watching me. <laughs> okay. Jerry, that was for you, honey. Jerry's, okay, so, Jerry. Jerry's ready to crack the whip at to me anytime, and I appreciate it. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. So, so as far funny. as this question goes, yeah, he's an impact positive yeah. impact on I mean you. I mean to give you a macro answer it's any anybody in, in uh, it's anybody that was willing to share and take me under their wing period like there are specific people but my makeup is is a is everybody I've met all my customers you guys anybody in the grow live academy anybody that I I invest my time in my improv people they have they have made a positive impact on me you know but my dad um I realized, you know, that I wanted to live out his legacy, right? Um, over 400 people were at his funeral. And I never realized why is because there was no agenda whenever he would be with people. He was just there to be with them, right? And I didn't see that because my mind was in a different place, mm -hmm. right? Um, Jeffrey Gittimer, um, he single-handedly saved my life. Um, when I was almost killed in a car accident in 2009, um, I've been studying his materials for almost 30 years, and that was really what was there for me is to go back on everything that he instilled into me. And I've met him several times, and I, I believe everybody has a mentor, whether they realize it or not. And for, you know, there's a lot of people that have shown up in my life to be mentors and trainers, and, you know, everybody's got something they can offer. But Jeffrey has been that one that really, you know, it's up to you and it always will be. And I've shared that with him several times in person. And I actually, when I was at a conference in Tennessee many years ago, I actually was the person to borrow somebody else's car to take him to the actual theater where he was doing his pre-check, his pre-sound check. And it's just when you really care for somebody and they do a lot for you, mm -hmm. let them know. Let them know. Tell them that you love them. Yeah. Who cares if they shrug it off? It really doesn't matter because it, you're doing it for you, not for them. That's true. There's two things I want to review that I just heard you say that really meant something to me. One is who's impacted you, who's made a positive impact on you. You said that everyone in your life that comes in and out of your life have made an impact on you. And yeah, wow, I've never really thought of it like that, but it's 150,000 times percent true because, and then we also have learned, right, that you want to put yourself around people who are like-minded and good. Mm -hmm. So because we are going to become and be impacted by the people we are around and surround us. So I get where you're going with that, Brian. And once yeah, again, right. I know what you say isn't just surface. Right. So I kind of read end of that and went down a rabbit hole, but I love that yeah. we do. Everyone makes an impact on us. That's so true. I've never really, it's so easy, but I've never really thought of it like that. Right. Well, number two. Oh yeah. Do you want to? Uh, no, go? you go. go ahead. Go for it. <laughs> number two is you said 
that you never really realized that your father was such a mentor and, and, and made an impact on you until he had passed. Why? Because he's no longer there to share with, you know, like he, just by removing his physical and mental being and a spiritual being, you know, uh, you don't really, you know, when all you have is what he taught you, you know, up to the point that he passed away, that's all you got. Right? I understand. And you so know. then you realize what a void there is. Like when he was around, you were absorbing all of the things that he had to offer and he was your mentor. But then all of a sudden he's gone and you realize how much of an impact he had on your day to day life. That makes mm -hmm. sense, too. I mean, he he told me he told me a couple of years before he passed away because I was I was really disconnected from my family. And in my opinion, when somebody passes away, um, I've just noticed this psychologically is that when when people pass away, there's a tendency for family to come together because it's urgent and all of that. But then through the course of time, everybody go back goes back in their lives, mm -hmm. right? When people actually come together because of a result of somebody passing on, what happens to those people that actually get closer together and stick together, right? And my cousins and, and a couple people were in my life where that's still the way it is now. We came closer together and we never severed ties. Wow. But I see in a lot of gatherings and whatnot, like I had an uncle that passed away a couple months ago. The, the closest uncle that I, that I have, right? Um, you know, because he didn't judge anybody. He would laugh, you know, like he suffered. He had multiple heart attacks. He was in Vietnam War. He had Agent Orange. He, he had a lot of problems, right? A lot of, lot of health problems. But he would always put other people in front of himself with humor, you know, making That's people feel comfortable. country. Yeah. And so that those types of people being taken away from me, it, they instilled a lot into me in terms of like how to treat people. But my dad said something to me when we, before we went to a family gathering, because I was the first one in my family to go to college. Okay. And my, my parents provided, you know, financial for that. And it was, but then obviously what I learned in college is going to be different. And I don't relate to several of my family members, not because I don't care about them. It's just because I don't do those things. Like my family's big into hunting and fishing and outdoorsman stuff, mm -hmm. but that, that lived and died with my dad, right? That was something that we preserved. And he said something to me that he goes, but he had a beautiful way of doing it without forcing it upon me. Yeah. He gave me the rationale and gave me the facts and then he allowed me to choose. OK, so what he said was, and I quote, son, if mom or I should pass away and you're not close with your family, you're going to be lonely. He didn't know that he was passing on. Right. And so that's been a uh, that's been something for me that's very near and dear to my heart that I live out my legacy with him in mind. But also, though, I'm going to be me. I'm going to be, Lynn knows about some of this stuff. I'm going to be closest to the ones I want to be closest to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not trying to create friction with my family members or anything like that, but I'm not going to be somebody I'm not going to be. Right. You know? And you know, even family, I mean, listen, we love family. Right. There's a love in there, but then how you spend your time, you know, you, you kind of go toward likeness. Mm -hmm. So people who are more like you and have the same interests, that means that you don't love your family any less. It's just the time you spend, you kind of want to gravitate toward those who yeah. are like you. And that's so that we're human beings. And I, I believe that that's a hundred, that's totally fine. Well, so I get where you're saying. Well, and being an only child and whatnot, I didn't have brothers or sisters. My parents never had a test child, you know, <laughs> where they could be like, Hey, okay, we're going to take all the good and put it on this kid and get rid of all the bad, right? Like they tried everything on you and it ended with you. Well, look <laughs> at me. I love look at me. So much. Look at was, me. You got all the love. All the love. That's amazing. And so, and so it's like when, when you He's have a love to, child, leave him alone. No, child. just <laughs> when you have to find out things on your own yeah. and you don't have brothers or sisters to lean off of older or younger, well, you, you find other like-minded people. And it's like, I don't know if there's any research about this, but it's like, you know, um, only children tend to find other lonely or other um, uh, single children. You know what yeah, I mean? Where it's like they, mm -hmm. and then they, and then they bring, then they create relationships because they're like brothers or sisters then. Yeah. And so yeah. I've been individual for a long time just because I had to figure stuff out on my own. 
Right. You know? I, yeah, I get that. I totally get that. So, you know, hey, listen, we learn and we grow and we gravitate toward people in the same likeness. And we want to put ourselves with people who also make us feel good and like normal. <laughs> like, oh, we're the same. We're like, like you know, that's, you know, well, a brother or sister from another. It's okay. And, and there's one type, there, there's one group of people that this day and age about, you know, my belief system and, and being a part of, uh, you know, my show with Lynn, reading her book, reading Rex's book yeah. and really embodying things is that I don't, I love everybody, but my tolerance for fake people mm -hmm. and people that are just inauthentic for whatever reason, I just, I, I'm going to dismiss myself. I'm going to remove myself from those equations and, and those people, because it's like, why do you feel like you have to be somebody you're not? Right. Um, and that's healthy. Yeah, it's, it's a healthy mindset for mm -hmm. you to have and for all of us to have. Right. Nicole Young, I was the oldest and I wasn't the best example. <laughs> LOL. I showed what not to do. Ha ha. I have a sister and, like that. An example is <laughs> an example. So there we go. <laughs> yeah. Example, good or bad. We're learning. Thank exactly. You. Absolutely. Little rebel. Nicole. So so with that, I know, I love it. So with all that said, um, this next question here, do you, yeah, can you so recall? What, yeah. What, what is your favorite childhood memory? Um, I would have to say it's, uh, learning bad habits from my uncles. <laughs> That's your favorite? <laughs> yeah. Um, because it's like when I was young and whatnot, there was a lot of love and humor and whatnot. And, uh, my, my dad single-handedly built a cabin by himself. I mean, he was, no, no plans, no nothing. Just, you know, he, he conjured it up in his head and he made it happen in reality. And every holiday, because my birthday is on September 4th, so Labor Day weekend, back in the days of Wolfman Jack would be on the radio doing marathon, you know, radio broadcasts and all my family would be up at the cabin. And so just hanging out with them, learning bad things to do, like <laughs> armpit farts and, you know, just pull my finger yeah exactly <laughs> yeah i get it. i know i get it you know and it's like everybody had their own personalities but everybody was loved and appreciated for those distinctions mm -hmm. you know and so a lot of those people have passed on but it, it, they instilled into me the depths of love that i you know that it um i didn't necessarily have because i didn't have any brothers or sisters you know so you cool. lean on that stuff from other people then you know and it just happened to be family so it was just those moments that I look back on now, it's like I was young and impressionable. So <laughs> yeah. well, Lynn and I can, uh, you know, Lynn and I've had discussions too about um, how we want to be our authentic selves. Yeah. And it sounds like from the stories that I've already heard you tell, your family allowed you to be you. M meaning, you know, everybody can say, well, my family didn't No, There are some people who like to control and say, you need to do this or that. It sounds like your family really embraced you learning how to be and love what you love and enjoy what you do and be your authentic self. And I think maybe that's why those feelings and the things you speak of so often run really deep inside of you because it's part of who you are. Yeah. You and want it, to be authentic. And it's, I, I don't, I've learned a lot you know, from, from people and just observing their character. And I, it's, it's a collection of people. It's a collection of experiences, but I think that what really hit it in was my car accident, right? Yeah. Which it's like, why, why, why can't you just be you? Why do you got to yeah. try to be, you know, like there's a lot of quotes out there in the world about, you know, being even 1% inauthentic versus being your full self, you yeah. know? Yeah. And it's a way, it's a waste if you're going to have to try to maneuver and uh, persuade or convince to try to appear a certain way. And it's like, man, if they don't like you the way that you are, maybe it's not worth it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Lynn know? is a poster child for that. You know, Lynn, aren't you? You are. You're a poster child for being authentic. And if people don't like it too bad. Well, you know, it's, it's not an easy road to take, but sometimes no. you got to take it, but you know, you got to take it because you know that if you're not being the best person you can be, everything you you give to this world comes back to you in tenfolds and you definitely need to um to realize that um your mouth is mightier than a sword and uh it's it's just really important to no matter what you do stand by it if that's how you feel or that's how you're going to behave then be that way but there's consequences to being not you know because like it's one of those things is 
people don't do onto them the way they want to be done onto them back to them. So with that said, they don't realize that would you like somebody talking or being like that to you? Because right. if you're okay with that, remember you're getting that back. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of the day, that's, that's sad when people don't learn that lesson. So you're right. And that's a lesson that I think all three of us learned growing up our, and our parents instilled mm -hmm. that in us. Um, but it also, for me personally, it just feels icky. I mean, yeah. I, I've never, if I've ever, I, if I knew that I hurt someone's feelings, I would be devastated. Yeah, I would never intentionally ever say or do anything to anybody to, to hurt them. So, but in the moving on with more about yes. Brian. Yes. So um, actually I like about Brian, because I love your authenticity. You know, I love, I've watched, I've watched you on the show and I've listened to what you've said and it's, it's very inspiring to me. He, um, he's grown so much even since I, since when I met him and mm -hmm. he's just, he's so, he's so love and he's so, I want to be the best person I can be no matter what. And he is, he, he's just, he, you know, and I, and I've had to give him some tough love, but he knows it comes from, and I've had to give Debbie look tough love too. He's already, I, she's already which, in shape. Let me tell you. Which, which well, really could it go there? That, that day, my day is well, coming on that. And but, that's, yeah. It's and, fine because you know, you, when you're, we're all being authentic and having the conversations. Yeah. It's well, so important. People don't want to talk about it. And that and and that goes back to two lessons I learned in theater school is, is that be openly willing and able to accept criticism. Number two, do something about it. Yeah. And what I remember it's when I started, you know, having to do one or two minute Shakespeare monologues. Right. <laughs> I don't follow Shakespeare. My mind is not wired to understand <laughs> Shakespeare, but I did it to get the credit in the experience. Yeah. Right. But what the distinction was, is that the students at that time, because I was seven, eight years older than they were, what they didn't realize in that moment was, is that these people that are critiquing them are not doing it personally. Mm -hmm. As an actor and what you displayed up on stage, that's what they're critiquing. They're not critiquing you as a person, but they, they didn't develop that understanding or that distinction yet in their thought process. Right. That makes sense. All right, you guys. We got a couple more questions here. We got, I'm excited for this. Wow. This is going fast. No, it's yeah, like it's going fast. Okay, so here we go. So, yeah. so we opened so, a can of worms. I now. am. This is, I am so excited about this. Brian, tell everyone, what do you do now? I uh, I do a lot of different stuff. Um, <laughs> number one is uh, a lot of my business is moving into more uh, just full-fledged planning design, the creation of the experience less about, um, you know, like the physical nature, you know, like lifting and all of that. Um, I, a lot of, because of Jerry and because of Lynn, um, I will be a published author very soon. Yay! Um, and it's, um, I got my butt kicked, you know, several months ago and it, I needed it. I really did because uh, all of my books have been written for a long time. I just didn't have the people around me to like, what do I do with it? Or how do I put it into the world? Right. <gasps> He's I got the piece of something. What? Oh, I just thought of something. What? You know what? You know what your dad did? He just got an idea to build a cabin. What did he do? He went and built the sucker. Right. Yeah. So you, you got a book? Go publish the sucker. You kidding? Yeah. The, he's at the piece of cake part, but I, I think, <laughs> I think if anything, he, he's so, he's so hard on himself that oh, yeah. he was like, he was like, well, you got to start and finish something. Well, he started writing all these articles, but he hasn't finished it. So right. now he's going to get, the, but he's got it. I was like, well, if you need a design, when I got the design, well, if you need this, I got that. I'm like, well, why isn't it published yet? <laughs> but There's... Brian, you've written, you're a published article. You've published yeah. articles. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, you're already published, right? You've yeah. already done that as well. You've done so much stuff, but keep going about what to do now. No, everything about everything I'm doing is about writing is about, I mean, next to my accountant, and any you know, my doctor, I would say my graph designer is the next post, most important person to me because that person makes me look good through all my content. Like I've got about 150 like electronic guides that still have yet to be written. Um, about 11 books with new titles always coming up in my brain, which content with content that's already written. Once you um, get started, I, I want to know. He's number I'm... 52 book. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's gonna have a whole like. Oh, it's gonna be an encyclopedia. Yeah, I'll be like underneath my encyclopedia. Encyclopedia. I mean, this is the Brian Callum edition. Right some publishers are like, or when's that author gonna? No, 
Fuck, wait five seconds. Oh, wait, the next one was probably published. Yeah, we've got <laughs> them coming. The quickest okay. edition <laughs> guy. <laughs> There's um I have a I have a collection of taking all of my content in manageable bites because that's how we we watch and consume things these days is to take uh, and do those all into short little videos and then trickle them out on social. There's going to be about three to five hundred little short little 20 second to one minute videos. Right. Just very simple. I edit them on my iPhone or my my tablet and I'm good to go. But then also, though, the time has come for me to just um, to do a wedding podcast, to do a wedding. Here we go. Show. There and, we go. Uh, I'm like, I know what you do, but you've yet to say you're like, da, da, da. weddings, yeah. weddings, people listen to this. Like this guy is the everything that is wedding. If y'all are getting married <laughs> or, you know, someone who's getting married, you have to follow this guy. I found him on TikTok. <laughs> I love those. It's like no, Wait, he got his TikTok going. I do have my TikTok going. <laughs> yeah, I guess like, I haven't been over there. Look, oh my gosh, it's like uh, you know he gives tips, like really quick tips about you know planning a wedding, being in a wedding, how to enjoy it, all these different things, and it's like it Debbie, is genius. I know there's a reason why he didn't want Lynn to know about TikToks. <laughs> Yeah, that he's doing them because he knows once I know no. that they're gonna they're gonna surface out. Oh can, my gosh! I'm gonna sit crazy. here for a minute. Listen, listen, I want you to what? Okay, let me let me. Lynn's like, listen, girl. I put the question up, and you're all around it. How did you get interested in weddings? I would have. Uh, there's a lot to it, but in short, it's the the love that people really feel at weddings, right? Um, there's all these spoofs, there's all these videos online. There's, there's all sorts of, I mean, the entire world of weddings is above and beyond a conversation we can have for hours. You know what I mean? Let alone in a couple minutes, but it's the love it's for people to come together and to see something or witness something that they've never seen before. Right. They've never felt before. Right. How emotional can a wedding be? How much fun can it be? How much laughter can it be? How, um, you know, how can it grab how can a wedding experience that people have been to hundreds of times look and feel different, you know? And it is. And, it starts with the love. You're right. And, and if people are stressed out and you, they turn into bridezilla and groomzilla, how do you help them have the wedding pre, I mean, you know, part of the stress, most of the stress, right, is planning it and getting to that point. Right. What do you do to help? And I don't really know what you do with them. I mean, do you just provide information? Give me, no. I don't understand. No. Explain that to me. So it all depends on what somebody wants me for, but a majority of my business is all word of mouth and referrals, right? Okay. So it's like the longest standing couple that I maintain contact with is over 25 years. So, you know, and I, this year will be 30 years for me full time. So 25 years is the longest couple I've maintained contact with, oh you my know, gosh. and it's, it's a lot of work. But it's it's done for them. It's not done for me, you know, and I think that that's where a lot of people, you know, if they want to create a word of mouth referral based business is that they want the quickest way to get another event. So they, hey, if you know of anybody, no, 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 that's the wrong way to do it. If you're doing it for the right reasons um, with with the way that weddings are today is, is that when I and I don't believe in the term bride and groomzilla, I just don't because it's all personified by the media. Right. If you give me a bride and groom that are looking at a table of money, right, their wedding budget, and you and pretty much you light it on fire, that's pretty much what they're doing with all the professionals that they reserve, right? No matter if they've seen them before, no matter if they heard great things about them, they're basing it on a risk. They're basing it on, well, we hope they do well, right? Mm -hmm. And any couple that I work with, they realize pretty quickly, almost to the point where I don't have to mention it, but you do realize that we're not talking about if your wedding will be awesome or amazing. When? We're talking about how awesome it may you be. Know, you know what? Yeah. I just had, I haven't heard this yet, but I found something I'm going to play right now. Do it. <laughs> Who's going the extra mile for you? These are the professionals to value the most. They're selfless, have a serving mindset, and want to help you any way they can. This is Brian Callum from Brian Callum Productions. See you in the next one. You, you got the baby face. I I, I knew you were gonna do a surprise. I knew. Lynn no, 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 no. 
I need to tell you that I did not know you had the TikTok going. And the because TikTok. she mentioned it, I went right there right away. Okay. And I went. Chance? He's like, oh, really? I'll just pull that up right now. You didn't have to tell me in advance. I'll do it right Shoot. now. So, no, I did not do that in advance. That was on the fly. Oh, That's the what fly. I was doing. It's a fly girl. <laughs> well, you know what? I enjoyed it. And I was getting to know a lot about you through those. But so... What you do then, Brian, is you have this couple and you can take them through the entire process. Yep. Okay, so what, how do you take people? Well, I do want to ask that. But oh, I you want me to wait? You want I, me to I wait? I do. I do want to wait because okay, I want to know. Because I know, you know, it's all about the love, the passion. And I already know, and we all can see that you are a perfectionist. Already <laughs> we get that. Okay, right? Because We're it, trying to break that a little bit for yep. you before you get these articles out, before you get your books out, before and you have everything ready, but it has to be perfect. So clearly you are a detailed person who loves to have everything perfect for your people and for yourself. Mm -hmm. So with knowing that, we already know we're in good hands for our wedding, okay? Yeah. And you're a loving person and you have integrity. So that's also great. So mm -hmm. then tell me what you do. You say, okay, I've got this couple and here's what I'm gonna do for you to make it the best experience from planning no. 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 It starts with a deep understanding of who they are. Oh my gosh, that's where your psychology comes in. Thank goodness you got that degree because I'm telling you, when you're working with people getting ready to get married, you better have you the, better understand how to deal with psyches. The that's the first several months of the whole process is is just relationship building, right? Wow. It's it. I mean, when I meet with a couple for the very first time, I want to have everybody there. I want to have parents there. I want to have bridesmaids. I mean, anybody, wow. right? Because That's everybody's cool. opinion. I mean, if they're not a key decision maker, they're an influencer. But wow. I also want to understand where their mind is in terms of weddings that they've been to. I don't want to use those as like a clone. I just want to understand where they're coming from. Like, if, do they go to weddings in big cities? Do they go into weddings in small cities? Because I know that obviously trends are going to change. You know, yeah. in the bigger cities, trends are going to go through a lot faster than in the small towns. Right. But then also, though, I want to understand any preconceived notions or, or thoughts like like self-limiting beliefs that they might have about weddings, like because they've seen weddings done in a certain way. So then therefore they think like it, we can't do it because the only interpretations that they've seen are a certain way. But you know? they can make it their own based on what they want from their heart and soul. And yeah. it's not wrong. It's right because it's for them. I love this, Brian. No, I've never known of anyone to do this. And you know, it's funny <laughs> as I as I think because we got a couple more questions, and I, you know, I'm the producer here it, type of thing. We got it. But you know what? I think this is great. Is uh, both of you guys are going to become uh, customers of mine. You're going to be yeah. you're going to yeah. be producing shows, and I think that Debbie would really love to deep dive. On, a inter <laughs> on her show. I already it. know that. Let's I just know it. I can I'm, see I'm that. I'm loving that's, it. It's, that's I mean, gonna be it's not like I'm getting married or anything, but no, but I know a lot of people who are, and I, I, that is amazing. Like I immediately went to what flowers do you want? You got the rain, you got the dress. And also just so everyone can see, I've got my white on today <laughs> and I had a bouquet made. <laughs> and I still have my flowers. These over are here. my flowers. Yes. Because I, I had to, I'm a theme girl. I'm yes, a theme girl. Are. Pick that right up on that at the beginning. He'd be like, "This." I, I love it. So we got like three more quick questions. Right, okay, you guys. It. Let's so do her. Let's get her done. So I want to know: Do you have any funny or interesting stories that you can share? Obviously, no names <laughs> attached. About working with wedding clients, like anything fun you can share? Uh, can you give me a little bit more information? Yeah. Like, you know, yeah, like, like give me an idea. Like, have you ever worked with someone that completely blew your mind with what they wanted or what they did or, okay. or did you ever work with someone that you thought, okay, after getting to know you guys, why the heck are you getting married? So, okay. There, there's one groom that, uh, that comes to mind. Cause I, I could go through, you know, I, I stopped counting at 300 weddings. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Lynn would be like, I'm just shutting us down. I'm producing this. Bye. Yeah. She did. She just goes in the background and we talk, you know? So there <laughs> was one groom is coming. <laughs> there was one groom that was a UW Madison graduate. He was, he's an engineer and, um, I've learned to read people very well, you know, through the course of time. But it was like he wanted to make sure that his bride's, you know, his his future wife's wedding was hers. But I'm like, no, nah, that don't cut it for me because I ask if, if it if it comes to be, I'll ask a groom, are you helping to pay for the wedding? 
And if they say yes, and I'm like, well, then you are concerned about what happens. It's just maybe not for these things, right? So I gave him his space and I knew that he was conjure, you know, he was creating something, but I didn't know what it was. And he goes to me, he goes, because he had to feel it out. You know, it's new and different. And he came up to me and he goes, hey, Brian, for our, our introductions, would it be okay if I smash a guitar and carry in my wife? <laughs> right when we come in the room and I'm like, absolutely. I love you even more, you know, <laughs> but he needed that space to, to, to see where he's at, to, to, to stretch his own creativity. Yeah. If it would have been forced upon him, he probably would have boarded up and not would have did it, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's unwiring. We don't know what we don't know that that's that, you know, like Steve Jobs said it back in the day and God, God bless his soul. People don't know what they want until you show it to them period. And so if people have never seen something at a wedding, they never know it exists. And the more times that they see the same things, the more that they see that that's all that exists. And they it's programmed. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I mean, just, just look at when you get an invitation in the mail, okay. For a wedding, your brain (laughs) is working on automatic about like, when it is, do I like these people? Am I going to go all sorts of things? Like you're, you're pre-programming this all without even really thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's fun. I okay. love that. Thank you for sharing. We got two more. Uh, more questions. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what is the best advice you can give future brides and grooms? I know sure. it's to come to Brian Calm, of course. Well, there's, there, there's two things. Number one is your priorities. And what I mean by that is who are your priorities? The wedding professionals that you invest more money in, that you pretty much give the the keys to, to create your wedding, but then also though, the ones that you reserve the earliest, right? Not everybody that you're going to be considering, you know, I think that there's depending on trends, but there's anywhere between 12 to 16 wedding professionals you're going to consider doing business with before your day to represent you in some way, right? Not every one of those professionals, because you're dealing with people, you're not dealing with companies, right? There's going to be people serving you. And so who are your priorities? And number two is, if you don't answer that question, you're going to be on a hamster wheel about what is. Mm -hmm. Then you go into the marketplace and you're going to be spinning your wheels about listening to pitches and sales and blah, blah, blah. And everybody's going to turn into a commodity, right? But then you don't know, you don't know what kind of outcome you want because you haven't had conversations as a couple. What do we want our wedding to look like? What do we want it to feel like, right? The best decision you can make as a couple is to have conversations with yourself and get it as, as deep as possible. Mm-hmm. As, as raw and real. Correct. Right, Lynn? Yep. No, pun, no pun intended. That's right. <laughs> which, which, uh, <laughs> Maybe comes, there is. Which which comes into the, what are your future plans? Yeah. What Do you do you have anything big coming up? I think you do. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be the, the live stream show that uh, Lynn is going to produce for me and uh, one of my colleagues. Uh, number two is, is that uh, book, I've had a lot book, of people book. tell me that I need to create a master class. I need to teach other people. Yeah. I need to train other people. Oh, I've been uh, telling you that. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. The, the well, books. Yeah, because what you have, Brian, is so unique and in a, in a good way. You know, it's it's all wisdom about- in weddings. The wisdom of weddings. The wisdom of weddings. Oh, old wisdom, what, old wisdom, what, one. Right. wisdom weddings planner our wisdom wedding master oh we got to still keep it under the under the umbrella of uh you know of uh what you're creating lynn so yeah i'm talking about you man you're just <laughs> like yeah the wisdom i mean the wisdom I of, of weddings i mean every, you're like everything wizard. Are- the wizard of wisdom Ooh. of weddings Woo! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> there, there's there's so much but it's all within it's all within live streaming it's all within sharing messages it's all within giving people value and and um i remember uh, author scott mccain lynn knows this is that prior to you know i mean he's a best new york times best-selling author and he told me he goes brian you're never going to be able to you know uh, you're never going to be able to determine you know how somebody reacts to your message but he's like, how many people will it take for you to impact for you to get your message out there? And I said, well, if I can help one bride, one groom, one parent, one uncle, one, you know, whoever, it will be well worth, you know, going through that work. And so that's my life mission is to help, you know, and I probably won't even know all these people I help. But uh, it's really coming to the surface that it's all about my writing. It's all about getting people to think differently about what's possible mm-hmm. for their wedding day. And, um, and obviously hone is- my skills for video. 
know. Now the world is ready to see you, my friend. Yes. And I'm excited. And a hundred percent, Lynn, and you have a lot to offer, Brian. You, you are one amazing dude. And I really feel that sincerity, compassion, love that you have within you, that when you do this master program to teach other people eventually how to do your one person. You can't marry everybody. You can't get everyone ready. But what you are offering and providing as a learning tool is huge. And maybe we'll have, I mean, you could, you could listen, doing it the way you do it may keep people from getting divorced later because they're figuring things out in the front before yeah. doing all the ceremonies. I love it. You're amazing. <laughs> Yeah, he I'm is. so happy we had this time together. I I'm so I'm blessed, honored. and I and we're thankful that we asked you like kind of like at the last minute, so to speak. Yeah, huh? Brian's you know, like, listening. I'm gonna step right up to the plate. You know, you're a doer. Yeah, good for he you. Is. He so is so proud of you. I I love him, and he's just yeah. I yeah. I <laughs> I I'm one of his number one fans. <laughs> so oh, you know what. I'm going to, instead of our normal outro, I'm going to play the video with him again. And I want you to take notice of a couple things in this video. Wait, I, well, I don't know what the t-shirt says. The red one with the white letters. Oh, what, say? what, what did it say? Watch that's, um, that's one of the times that I met uh, Jeffrey Gittimer in person. He was actually in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, downtown. And uh, I, all I did was reach out to his people before I really knew him. And I said, Hey, what would it take to, you know, treat Jeffrey to breakfast or spend a little time with him before his presentation? And the person said, Oh, um, just meet down here at this time. And uh, he'll come down and get you. And every time I go and see Jeffrey, I always get a custom t-shirt with a quote and I sign it and then retire it. <laughs> okay. And it says, kick your own ass is one of his. Uh, there we go. Yeah. I need uh, to kick my own ass sometimes. Uh, I love it. So this, this outro going out, um, you'll see what a sharp dude he is. Black pinstripe with a purple. With the purple tie. I saw the purple yes, tie. Yes, purple tie. Uh, you know, and then you'll see videos of him with me in the show because we have such a great time in our shows. <laughs> we, we really had a year of just fun videos that we're going to end up cutting those up and they're going to end up being Matt. I mean, there's going to be tons of them once I, I get that going. But but again, it just the memories and stuff. And and just so you guys know, this isn't like the last of all of us together. So yeah. um, so I'm super excited about all that. Who said um, that? Who <laughs> said that? <laughs> well, you guys, I love you guys very much. And so funny. This is only 20 second video. So we'll see what a good producer I am. I'm going to play that and try to end the show at the same time. But enjoy this little video. And I know that it meant a lot to Brian, but he knew that I had to have a picture of him and, and Jeffrey Gittimore because I know what he meant to him. So I had to have that in there. And then the times with him and then just just that baby face Finsta and his <laughs> pinstripe suit. You're making so, me blush. Yeah. So you guys stay right there. I'm going to do the outro and, and try to end the show. So thank you guys. Um, thank just you, a little bit more about Brian. So have a good one, guys.